First of all, I want to just take a moment to thank you guys for being here. I recognize in today's hurried uh, society, a rush paced society, your time is really valuable. So I always like to just thank you. You could have been home now watching AGT or arguing with your teenagers like I do all the time, uh, but you chose to be here with, with us tonight and we want to let you know that we appreciate that. Um, I'm going to talk to you about something that I think is the most important thing in your life and that's you. And when I go around and I see a lot of women in this audience, which is really cool because I know some of the responses I'm going to get when I ask you questions. Um, I ask questions and I figure, guys, if we're going to spend the next hour together, let's engage one another. Let's really get thinking about this because my job is when you leave here is for you to change something about your health and something about your life. Agreed? So if I ask you this question, right? Tell me something, and I'm going to start over here. Tell me something important in your, this is a very easy question. Mary Lou, tell me something really important in your life. My family. Your family. Gwen. My family. Your family. Anybody? Grandkids. Your grandkids. Th sir? Tell me something really important in your life. My family. Your family. Okay? Now, we could go around, some of you may say my education. Some of you are, a lot of you are going to say your family. You know, Chad may say my, his fitness, right? Some people may say your dog. I have two dogs they are pretty important to me, right? I see a woman over there. But I would tell you, you bring yourself to every relationship that you have in your life. And I'm going to say that again. You bring yourself to every relationship you have in your life. And so the most important thing that you have in your life is you. Try taking you out of the equation of your life and see how well your life goes, or others ladies, the people that depend on you. And it's funny thing, but the word energy, and how many people would like to have more energy? Raise your hand. Every hand always goes up when I, when I ask that question. The word energy, if you look it up in the dictionary, do you know what it says? It says the capacity to do work. Anybody besides me have a lot of work to get done this week? Okay. The capacity to do work. Doesn't mean you're going to get the work done. It just means that you have better energy, you have better capacity to get more done. And that's what I'm here to talk to you about. Albert Einstein said that energy is not created or destroyed, it's just transferred. So I'm going to tell you how do you tap in, get more energy, live your life in a way that's congruent with your genetics. Fair enough? Okay? So let's get started here. So I I want to start off by sharing with you, I'm a third generation chiropractor, I have 12 active members of my family that are chiropractors, and I had a really great practice. I've been in practice 22 years, I was in practice about 10 years, I had a great practice, it was helping people with a lot of problems, but I wasn't satisfied deep down inside, and the reason was, is I wasn't, I saw the way I was living my life, I saw the way our family lived our life, and we were very much into lifestyle, we believe that you have a responsibility to take care of yourself. And we also believe that it's very difficult in today's environment and it's getting more and more difficult to stay healthy because we have so many opportunities to screw up every single day. My, I always say my dogs are so lucky, you know why? They eat what I feed them and I feed them healthy food and they don't have choices. I take them for a walk almost every day and a run. They don't have choice whether they're going for an exercise because they're going to exercise every day. Do you understand? We are a, the product of our choices, and our choices are killing us, aren't they? Okay? And how many people here, honestly, how many people feel like you're healthier today than you were five years ago? I know the eight weeks to wellness graduates probably feel that way. But it's a wonderful thing if you can raise your hand and say, you know what, I feel healthier today than I did five years ago. And that's what I want. I want everybody in this room to be able to live to their full capacity. How many people here would like to live at least 74 years? Raise your hand. And if you didn't raise your hand, you're just tired. I know that, okay? <laughs> Do you recognize that 50% of us in this room won't make it to 74? So I'm just going to divide this room in half, and I'm not going to tell you which half isn't going to make it. But that's what the CDC shows. But everybody raised their hand. And not only do you want to live to 74, but I don't know about you, but I don't want to be a burden on my children. And one of the things I've noticed being a doctor is just about the time we get our children, I have an 18-year-old and a 14-year-old, right? And my 18-year-old's just about going off to college, my 14-year-old's a freshman, he'll be going off to college soon. Just when we get our kids taken care of, who do we have to start taking care of? Our parents. Why? Because they are disabled mentally or physically and can't care for themselves anymore. 
How many people want to go out of this world being not only a burden to yourself, but a burden to other people? That's not the way I envision my life. And I see my life as that I have responsibility over the future of my life. And this patient here, Jeff, is a great example of what I see in practice and why I'm here in Arizona. People and somebody just asked me, do you get tired of traveling? I travel at least twice a week all over the country. I was just in Norway two weeks ago. People say, do you get tired of traveling? Never. Because I always get to meet people where I know this program saved their life. There's no doubt in my mind. And to me, that I would travel to the ends of the earth to know that somebody still has their dad in their life. Somebody still has their grandmother in their life. Somebody still has their spouse in their life. Because I want to tell you the story of Jeff. Because this is real, people. This is a real story that happened to me about two months ago. Jeff came to me in, in April. Okay? He comes in for neck pain, because I'm a chiropractor. That's what public views us as for neck and back pain. They don't know that we really are doctors of human physiology. That's what we do. We look at people's physiology. So he comes in to me, and we do, and we sit down. And I told him, listen, Jeff, you not only have a neck problem, you have a health problem. Okay? And I knew that because this was his wellness score. We in our office, and Dr. Brian Hester does the same thing, we don't leave your health to what you think or what we think. It's not subjective, it's objective. Your physiology, and remember this, physiology never lies. Your blood pressure is your blood pressure, your cholesterol is your cholesterol, your body composition is your body composition, your functional movement screen is going to tell us a lot about how your joints are moving. So uh, here's what I know. I know that people lie. Maybe not on purpose, maybe they exaggerate the truth, but I find that most people think they're a lot healthier than what they really are. And to me, when you go to court, your innocent, innocence or guilt is, is based on what? Hearsay or what is it based on? Evidence. Your physiology is our evidence to know whether you're healthy or not. And this was Jeff's physiology. Let's take a look. His diastolic blood pressure. And if you're a nurse, you know that's the lower blood pressure. When they say your blood pressure is 120 over 80, the 80 is the diastolic or down number. It was 104, dangerously high, and he was taking a blood pressure medication. His waist circumference is, was 47 inches, okay? A man should never have a waist measurement uh, above 40 inches. A woman should never, I don't care if you're eight foot tall, a woman shouldn't have a waist circumference above 35 inches means what do we carry in our waist if it's getting bigger guys do we have a lot of bones in our waist no we have a spine and it's about this big around if your waist is getting bigger it's because you're putting on adipose tissue unless you have really really big abs okay and I, I, I don't see anybody in this room who has really really big abs maybe Dr. Hester okay his BMI was 35.7 where does that put him normal overweight or obese obese okay Look at his, uh, his, his core flexibility. He failed, and we had people do core, just basic things. Lunge, squat, okay? Basic, basic movements. He failed two of his four movement tests, okay? His posture was horrible. He had uh, arthritis in his spine. Out of 100, he scored a 45. And here was, I sat down with him, I said, listen, Jeff, I've been doing this long enough to know you are headed down the wrong road. You're 48 years old. You don't have a neck problem, you have a health problem, and you need to address both. And here's what he said to me. He said, Dr. Dane, I own a travel agency. It's spring, we do a lot of cruises, it's the busiest time of the year. I don't have time to do eight weeks to wellness. I need you to fix my neck pain, and I need to get back to work. So I did. I fixed his neck pain. He was referred by a pa another patient of mine who referred him to my office. This guy was turning 50. So Jeff and my other patient, Mark, go down to Florida to celebrate Mark's 50th birthday. They take another couple, so there's three couples. While they were down there, Jeff has a massive heart attack and dies. His wife was so distraught that my patient, Mark, who's re relaying this story to me a week later, has to call his 16-year-old daughter and 14-year-old son to tell them their father wasn't coming home from Florida. So you want to know why I'm here in Arizona? That's why. That did not have to happen. As a doctor, I know that this guy was headed down the wrong path. The problem was 
He didn't know it, did he? And he thought, I'm healthy, I'm healthy, I'm healthy. Well, that's like playing Russian roulette. And you cannot play Russian roulette with the most important resource you will ever own. How many people in this room know somebody that's died way too young? Raise your hand. We're developed everybody. Do you know that the New England Journal of Medicine shows that 70 to 75% of the reason we'll get sick is tr directly due to lifestyle? And that's what this is about, guys. That's what this is about. It's about learning what do I need to do. You know, I always said, you know, one of the things, I always knew I wanted to be a, a young father. I don't know why. I had my first kid when I was uh, I'm 44. I was 24 years old. And one thing I realized is they don't come with owner's manuals. And I was scared to death. Like, how am I going to raise this kid? We do not come with owner's manuals. We've got to learn to take care of ourselves. And we're doing it in, in a society that doesn't care for us. Does that make sense? We are swimming upstream trying to stay healthy. A month later, he died of a heart attack, guys. So what's the lesson to be learned from the story? This is what I think it is. Take action now. Take action now. And the best thing that you can do, guys, is to know about your physiology. We give everybody a grade. And the best grade you can know is how healthy you are. And if you're, you got an A, we're going to pat you on the back and say, keep doing what you're doing. But if you're like Jeff and you got an F, we're going to look in the eye and tell you that you need to change. Why? Because the quality and the quantity of your life is on the line. It's not just the fact that God, people are dying at 48 years old of a heart attack. It's that people are living to 70 and 80. The last 20 years of their life, they're not even living. Like Dr. Hester said, they're on a laundry list of medication. They don't know their name. They're not living. They're waiting to die. That's not the way I want to live, guys. I want to go out like, you know, water skiing, partying, like just having come back from the Alps, like having a good time. I don't want my life. Dr. Denise, my sister who developed the program, has a great saying. She says, listen, your life should be like a candle. It burns the same intensity, same intensity, and then at the end, flickers a couple times and goes out and we move on, right? But how many people, their, their candle's getting halfway down and, that, and, the, and the light goes out? It happens way too often in our society. And as I told you guys, almost 50% of the US population will die before the age of 74, and 50% of Americans will die of two diseases, heart disease and cancer. And guys, let me ask you a common sense question. Can we prevent heart disease and cancer, yes or no? Yes. For the most part, we can. Okay? So I love this slide because I want you to think about this. I call this present bias. We are all biased by the present. We don't think about the future. How many people really think about what they want to look like when they're 70 years old on a regular basis? Good for you, because I do, right? My wife, I, when I get out of the shower and when I look in the mirror, I said, oh my gosh, honey, it happened again today. She's like, I know. I said, I got better looking again today. I don't know how it happens. <laughs> 44 years, every day I look in the mirror, I got better looking, right? I'm just teasing, guys, right? I am, I am a little bit egocentric, but my point is I take good care of myself, and I'm proud of what I see in the mirror because I work hard at it. Do you understand? How many people right now would want to strip off all their clothes, go home, try this exercise, strip off all your clothes, and take a long look in the mirror and tell me if you like what you see? And let me tell you something, we don't make decisions based on logic. We make decisions based on emotions. So when you get ticked off enough, or angry enough, or upset enough, guess what? You're going to change, and good for you. Good for you. Stop, we got to stop being callous to this. We got to change, because lives are on the line. So we humans, we're, we're uh, basically, we aren't logical, we're more emotional. We tend to live in the present and not really think about who we're becoming. That's called being present biased. So your life and your health really needs to be like a bank account. This is exactly how I, I think of it. I want to make regular deposits into my health savings account because I know when I get older, I'm going to have to make some withdrawals, aren't I? There's going to be times that where life gets stressful and I want to reserve capacity to draw on. We all understand that with retirement. So why don't we do the same thing with our health? So many people say, well, I'm going to spend the first half of my life spending all my health to accumulate all this wealth. And then the second half, I'll then take that wealth to get my health back. Right? It doesn't work that way for a lot. It didn't work that way for Jeff. Right? It didn't work that way for my 43-year-old mentor cousin 
who dropped dead of a heart attack, three children, and his own plumbing business. And he was my mentor. He was a grade ahead of me in high school. Played football and wrestled just like I did. And nobody should die at 43 years old with three children and a spouse. Why? Because he didn't take care of himself after high school. I saw him at the family picnics. I saw what he ate, how he drank, how his belly was getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Does that make sense? And we all have the ability to change this, guys. This is the wonderful thing. So when you look up health, because if I ask everybody in this room, do you want to be healthy? Raise your hand if you want to be healthy. I know all the hands are going to go up. But if I ask you, what is health? How would you define health? Most people tell me this. Health is when you feel good, right? But let me tell you something. Jeff, after I corrected his neck pain, he felt pretty good. Matter of fact, he went down to Florida. If he wasn't feeling good, do you think he would have went down to Florida for a party? No, he felt good when he went to Florida, but he still dropped dead of a heart attack. How many women go to their doctor feeling good and they're diagnosed that day with a ma mammogram with breast cancer? So health has nothing to do with how you feel. It has everything to do with how you function. And so when you look it up in the dictionary, it says it's chemical, physical, and mental well-being. Chemical, physical, and mental well-being. And that's what we're going to talk about. When I talk about making deposits, guys, we need to t think about the three realms. How we're eating, that's the chemical. How we're thinking, that's the me mental. And then how we're moving, that's the physical. All right? So who's responsible for your health, guys? This is an easy question. Okay, you are, no one else can be responsible. And so many times I see the wives are trying to be responsible for their husband's health. Why? Because they love them, right? It's a joint effort. I teach my uh, male patients, eight weeks to wellness patients, they laugh at me when I tell them this. I say, why don't you go shopping, grocery shopping with your wife? When does your wife go grocery shopping? Saturday, Sunday? I said, why don't you go next time and go with her and learn some things? Right? I go after church every Sunday, I go grocery shopping with my wife. Why? Because eating to me is one of the most important things I can do every week. So I'd like to be a part of that decision making process. And you know what? I make better decisions because I'm engaged in shopping. Does that make sense? Okay. Once you take, I love hyphenating this word responsibility, guys. Look at it. Response ability. You have the ability to respond. You had the ability to choose what you ate for breakfast today, didn't you? You had the ability to choose whether you chose water as your primary beverage or diet soda or sweetened iced tea, didn't you? You had the ability to choose whether you exercised, took a walk, or you didn't today. You had the ability to give your spouse a great big hug and tell them how much you love them before they left to, for work. Yes? You have the ability to respond. That's what responsibility is. Nobody else can do it for you. So question, how do you know, if I told you that health has nothing to do with how you feel, how do you know when you're truly healthy? Good question, right? Because does everybody agree with me that that's a little bit of a slippery slope, slip symptoms, right? Because you can feel great one day and go to the doctor and be diagnosed with a plethora of things the next day. You know the average cancer is in the body for seven years before it becomes diagnosable with a lab test? or on an x-ray or a mammogram. So you have cancer in your body for seven years that's building before it's diagnosed. Are you healthy when you have cancer cells in your body? No, okay, so how do we know that we're healthy? Okay, we know we're healthy through what? Our physiology, our function, how our body is functioning. When our body is functioning at 100%, we know the body's healthy. And as I talked about early, guys, I don't want your lack of health to become a burden on someone else. And this is the problem in the United States, isn't it? Our lack of health is burdening our whole system economically, isn't it? Okay? And I'll prove it to you. The U.S. spends more money on health care than anyone else, and it's not effective. We spend too much time and money treating disease and not enough pre uh, preventing it. And you may not be able to see this, but I'll explain it to you. This is an article from Newsweek, guys. This is comparing all the, com uh, the countries and what, what they spend per capita. And the United States, this was back from 2010, and I'll just read it to you. The United States spent basically about 16% of every dollar in the United States is spent on healthcare. And we average about $7,000 per individual, okay? And there's other countries down here. For example, one of the number one countries, Japan, 7.9%. France is up here somewhere. France right here is 4,000. 
almost half of what we spent. And why is that important? Because the World Health Organization says that their healthcare system and the health of their people is radically better than ours. So we're spending double what they spend, and the United States is 37th according to the World Health Organization. And Japan and France are in the top five. So I, if we all went auto, is there anybody who uh, sells cars, automobiles? No? But if, we, if I took you guys uh, shopping for an automobile, okay, and you spent twice as much as I spent, and I got a car that outperformed your car twice as much, would you be a little bit upset? that I paid half of what you paid, okay, and my car is twice as, it runs twice as be better, it has all the luxury items that you don't have, yeah, you'd be a little bit upset. So let me ask you a question, because this is so important, and Dr. Hester, you may have to answer this for everybody. Why are we not up in arms that we spend so much money and the health of our people is one of the lowest in the industrialized countries? Does anybody want to answer that question? I'll tell you my, why I think is because somebody else is footing the bill, right? We have insurance companies that foot our healthcare bill. So who cares if I'm taking 14 medications? I'm not paying for it. I have Medicare that pays for, for, for my bill. But let me tell you something, if you were paying for that $40,000 bypass, maybe you wouldn't have so many Twinkies and hamburgers, <laughs> yes? If you had to write the check, and you're all laughing because you know it's true, okay? We, you know, our, our government doesn't buy our homes. They don't buy our cars. They don't buy our other insurance, but they sure are involved in the economics of our health care. And I think it really has kind of derailed us, and it's gotten, out, uh, gotten us away from being consumers in health care. Do you understand? That if we were consumers and we were writing checks, you know, if I had to write a check, if I'm a bad driver, I've got to write a bigger check to the insurance company, yes? But if I'm a bad health care consumer, right, do I have to write a bigger check? Not necessarily, but that's changing, I promise you. Healthcare can't be achieved, and Dr. Hester talked about this. Do you guys know that we make up 5% of the world's population? We account for 50% of the medication use, usage in the world. We account for 5% of the world's uh, population, but we account for 50% of all the medications taken worldwide. And again, I would not have a problem with this, guys, if, we, if our health was great compared to other countries. Okay? There's over... 153.8 billion prescription drug sales in the world, and as I told you, the World Health Organization ranks the U.S. 37th. Do you guys know there's only two countries in the world where they allow direct consumer advertising for drug sales? How many people see the, the, all the drug ads on, on TV? You know there's only two countries that allow that. New Zealand and the United States. And don't you, honestly, don't you really think we should let the selling of drugs be up to the doctors, right? I mean, seriously, We're, they're going to come on and sell us a drug. Most people are going and say, Doc, you think I should be taking Lipitor? Doc, you know, I saw the blue, bl blue butterfly floating around. I think that ambience for me. <laughs> seriously, did you do the studies? Do you really know how that's going to affect your body? I have people coming in on five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten different medications, and they don't think about the interactions being prescribed by two, three, four different doctors. That's not health care, guys. That's sick care. Okay, so what, what's wellness care? Because let's switch the conversation because I want to go to more of a positive, upbeat conversation. What is wellness care? Well, here's the biggest difference, guys. Sick care doctors focus on symptoms. And I do not want you to think that I am anti-medicine. Two years ago, I had the most wonderful doctor take my son's ruptured appendix out and save my son's life. And I get tingles when I think about him because he was an awesome man. And I really do believe he saved my son's life and he needed it, he was sick, okay? But well doctors, they focused on function. And you better believe, after Shane got home, I read in the riot act because the kid was eating too much sugar, right? How many kids are addicted to sugar? Okay, so we cleaned up his diet a lot after that. And that was my, I took responsibility for that, okay? I didn't say he had a genetic problem with his appendix. I have an 18 year old son that's never had a medication in his body. And if he needed it, I would give it to him. But he's never needed it. My 14-year-old, he needed it. Well, guess who lives a lot more congruently as far as eating better? My older son, exercising, my older son. My younger son, I gotta stay on him about his diet all the time. But that's called being a parent. 
I had parents come to me and say, well, Johnny, just, he won't eat fruit. He just wants to eat the snack wells or he just wants to eat the uh, Lunchables, right? I'm like, yeah, well, if Johnny told you you didn't want to go to school tomorrow, would you say, all right, you know what, Johnny? You're, you're five years old now. You're, you're old enough to make your own decisions, <laughs> all right? You don't want to go to school tomorrow? Fine. No, you'd say, get your butt to school, just like my dad would have said to me. And that's what we need to do. We need to start these, teaching these kids how to eat better, how to move better, and how to think better. So the difference between a sick doctor and a well doctor is one focuses on symptoms. Seriously, when you go to your doctor, what's the first question they ask you? What's wrong? How are you feeling? Okay? When you come to our office, we ask you a bunch of questions. Yeah, I want to know how you're feeling. But more importantly, I want to know how you're functioning. Because we live in a world of cause and effect. And this causes this, not the other way around. When your body's not functioning well, you're going to get symptoms. Does everybody understand that? Okay? So what should we focus on, the symptoms or the functional problem? Functional problem. Doesn't it make sense, guys? And that's why we created Eight Weeks to Wellness. So I want to talk to you about this program. This program, I think, is great because it is not one-dimensional. One-dimensional means you're going to go out and start an exercise program, but you're still going to eat like crap. Okay? One-dimensional means, ladies, you're going to follow a stringent uh, diet regimen, but you're not going to exercise. Okay? Or, you know what? I'm going to uh, diet and exercise on Monday, and I'm going to be pretty good on Wednesday, but then come Thursday, Friday, Saturday, I'm going to blow it and do whatever I want. There is no direction. We also need to think about the impact of stress and how we think. So we designed this program to really focus on the three tenets of your health. And let me tell you, if you focus on just these three guys, you've covered about 95% of what you need to cover with taking care of yourself. Okay? How you move, how you eat, and how you think. Somebody tell me, somebody tell me why we get sick. Why do we get sick? How we eat, lack of exercise and how we're moving, and stress, right? If there were certain things you were going to start a, a program to get yourself healthier, what would you start doing, Joe? Tell me one thing you would do different. Uh, Just tell me one thing. Stress. You'd move stress. That's how you're thinking. Tell me another thing, Catherine. Exercise. Katie? Exercise. Right? If, I ke if we kept playing this game, wouldn't you tell me exercise, diet, and remove stress? What else is there? <laughs> but, what did you say? Sleep. Okay, well that's how you think, right? That's not thinking when you're sleeping, by the way. I count that in the how you think part, because when you're sleeping, that's when you shut your brain off and stop thinking, okay? And by the way, health problems don't discriminate. Health problems don't care how much money you have, by the way, okay? They don't care how old you are. They don't care where you went to college and if you have a PhD, okay? Human physiology doesn't care. It just is. Does that make sense to everybody? Now I'm going to ask you a question, and ladies, please pay attention, because this one question can change your life. What's the single biggest determinant of how fast our body ages? In other words, why can you look at somebody who's 80 years old, and they look like they're 65? And then you can look at somebody who's 65, and they look like they're 80, yes? We have chronologic and biologic aging. Chronologic aging is easy, guys. We're going to get a year older on our birthday. Biologically, though, do we want to age faster or slower than our chronological age? Slower. How many people would like to look better than they, they uh, are uh, old? Right? How many people? Yes, everybody wants to look younger than they are. What's the single biggest w uh, determinant of that? Does anybody know? Lifestyle. Lifestyle. But what specifically? What biomarker? What one thing can I measure in your body to know how fast you're aging? Tell them, Dr. Hester. Cellular health, yeah? But take a look at this picture. That is the single biggest factor. How fast you lose muscle and how fast you gain fat. I want you to think about an old person. Does an old person who looks decrepit have a lot of muscle on their body? Does an older person who looks really healthy have muscle on their body? Is their posture good? Can you have good posture if you don't have good core strength? Everybody say no. Okay, because when you have no core strength, gravity has its way with you. Okay, and it just does this to you. Okay, trust me. So the most important thing, ladies, please, please listen to this. You've got to keep muscle on your body. And when you hit menopause, 
right? And you stop producing sex, sex hormones, it's very difficult to keep muscle on your body. So you got to work at it. And you ladies are great at cardio and spinning and walking and you love to talk and walk and you've got to do some res resistance training, okay? And men, you're just the opposite. You want to see if you can bench a thousand pounds, okay? But guess what? Your heart's a muscle too. How many people have heard of metabolic syndrome? Guys, this is the real problem in the country. This is what is going to bankrupt our country. And I want to read this. People with metabolic syndrome are at significant increased risk for de developing diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and site-specific cancers. Do you know if I added diabetes and obesity-related conditions, heart disease, and cancer, those three are going to take seven out of 10 lives in this room. Just those three diseases. And all three are significantly linked to having metabolic syndrome. A matter of fact, if you have metabolic syndrome, how many people know somebody with type 2 diabetic, di diabetes? Okay? If you have type 2 diabetes, you're nine times more likely to have had metabolic syndrome first. In other words, if you have metabolic syndrome, you're nine times more likely to be a type 2 diabetic. If you have metabolic syndrome, you're 3.5 times more likely to have a heart attack or stroke. And metabolic syndrome has no symptoms. Does anybody know what metabolic syndrome is? Metabolic syndrome is when you have three of the following five criteria. You have a waist measurement for men over 40 inches or for women over 35 inches. Okay? You have hypertension, meaning that your blood pressure is over 130, over 85 or greater. It means when your glucose fasting is over 100. Okay, everybody hear of glucose, right? It's when your good cholesterol, your HDL cholesterol is lower than 40, 50 for a woman or 40 for a man, and it's when your triglycerides are over 100. In other words, these are all very measurable things. We measure in our patients all the time. If you have three of those strikes, uh, the five strikes against you, you have metabolic syndrome, and you're headed towards a cliff. Do you know Jeff had all five? <coughs> he had all five of metabolic syndrome, and he chose not to do anything about it. Bad move, okay? Now, how many people, raise your hand, be honest, how many people know if you have metabolic syndrome because you've checked all five parameters? Okay? That you could go and get me those tests? Okay? How many people know if you have three strikes or two strikes? Do you know? Awesome. You should know. Because if you have metabolic syndrome, guys, you are headed down the wrong path. I don't want you to have any of those criteria. Yes? Okay? The healthiest people would have none of those. And what about our kids' future? Do you know the National Institutes of Health, they predict for the first time in recorded history that our children will not outlive their parents? They're predicting my kid's generation is going to see a life expectancy drop of about five years. Why? It's the way we are eating, moving, and thinking. Okay? And unhealthy eating and inactivity is the leading cause of death in the United States. 300,000 people die from the way we eat and the, fa the fact that we don't move. That's equivalent to, to uh, two 767 airplane crashing every single day. And if there were two jumbo jets crashing every single day, guys, would you want to maybe uh, research the airline industry, industry safety? I would. I wouldn't be here right now because I guarantee you I wouldn't have gotten on that flight this morning. Okay? But because all these deaths are scattered all over the place, we don't see it as a problem. But it is a problem, isn't it? It's a huge problem. You know, when I was young, guys, I, I didn't, when we went to water parks or the beach, I didn't see little boys with bellies hanging over their bathing suits. I didn't see it. And I see it today. And it's not because our genes have changed. It's because what we're eating has changed. Kids don't exercise as much. My kid has an Xbox, I know. Okay, but guess what? I turned it off. And, and send his butt outside to play with his friends. And he plays sports. Why? Because I want my children to grow up to have the same opportunities that I had. Do you understand? I want my kids to have energy because I want them to have the capacity to do work. Yes? 50 years ago, ladies, 50 years ago, the average woman's waist size was 27 inches. Average 50 years ago. Men, average waist size was 34 inches. Go put a tape measure around your waist, okay, and see if it's 27 inches. Men, see if it's 34 inches. And it's not, guys, your waist is not where your belt goes around. I'm sorry to tell you, 
Your waist is the white, it's at your belly button. That's what we're talking about. Your body fat, your fat, hangs over your belt, doesn't it? Yes? Okay? So we have to measure our waist at the widest part of our waist. So, so, so can you change? Because that's why you're here tonight, guys. Can you change this? Or can your spouse change this? And I, we see people change all the time. And I'm going to have a couple people talk to you in just a second. But I want to tell you about a couple of my patients. This was a woman, Joyce, who did the program about three years ago. And Joyce was a very interest, uh, interesting patient because she was a patient of mine for years. Remember I told you my father and grandfather were chiropractors? I actually took her care over from my father. So she'd been getting adjusted for a long time. They moved her company. I live in Philadelphia area in a suburb. They moved her company down to Philadelphia. And she was going to have to walk four blocks from the train station to her new uh, facility. And she couldn't walk four blocks. She could barely walk out to the car. So she said, all right, Dr. Dane, I know you're into this health and wellness thing. You got me, right? I want to do eight weeks to wellness. And she was only doing it because she, couldn't, she was afraid she was going to lose her job. So when I did her full history, she was taking 13 prescription medications being prescribed by four different doctors. 13. Okay, now if I took a healthy person and gave them 13 medication, what would happen, Chad? They'd get sick. They'd probably kill them. So what makes me think I'm going to take a sickly woman who has asthma and depression and allergies and all this stuff she was taking medication for, I'm going to shove 13 medications in her and I'm going to make her healthy. Guys, that's not health care. And that's what, what gets me really upset. So she comes to us, she starts eight weeks to wellness, right? After she finished the program, about a year into to the program, she's down to two medications. She's lost 50 pounds. She, gets on the, she can get on the floor. I remember walking into our fitness center and this woman couldn't even walk on the treadmill. And now she runs, runs on the treadmill. She's 58 years old. She's not an old woman. 58 year old people should be able to run. All right? And it's proof to me that in a year you can change. Because here, here's what I know. You're either getting better or getting worse. And I don't know about you, but I'd like to be like a fine bottle of red wine. You know what I mean? That I get better with age, not worse with age. Another uh, patient, Jim. And Jim came to me. He was referred by a medical doctor. And he said, you know what, Dr. Dane? I'm here because I'm heading down the same path my dad was. And his dad, interesting story, his dad was killed by diabetes indirectly. His dad was a diabetic, had lost both of his limbs. He was 59 years old, his dad had lost his legs and one arm because of diabetic neuropathy. His dad was on the way to dialysis and his ambulance was hit by another car. And because he had no legs, they had no way to restrain him and seatbelt him properly. He was ejected out of the ambulance and everybody in the ambulance survived except for him. So he said, Diabetes indirectly took my dad's life, Dr. Dane, because if he didn't have diabetes, he wouldn't have been in that ambulance. And he said, I'm headed down the same path. And when I did his wellness score and his blood work, he was absolutely right because he was a full-blown diabetic and hadn't been diagnosed yet. Okay? He was 270 pounds, a BMI of over 40. Jim has two children. He didn't have any kids. This was about four years ago, right? And he was just in my office the other day. He has two children now. He's down to about 190 pounds. He runs half marathons now. Okay? That is the potential. So he went from going to somebody who literally was on the same path of his father to a guy running half marathons. Why? Because he, he changed what he thought about, he changed what he ate, and he changed how he moved. This is a recipe for success. Okay? And I want to tell you, these are not, you know when you see the disclaimers at the, the uh, you know, the ab and the bun buster and it says at the bottom, these are not typical results? These are the typical results. What I'd like to do is just show you the ingredients of what this is. And the bottom line, guys, it's, I know it sounds simple and stupid, but healthy people make better choices than unhealthy people, don't, don't they? And it seems like such common sense, eating healthy, moving healthy, thinking healthy, but here's what I say. It may seem like common sense, but it certainly isn't common practice for most of us, isn't it? So common sense isn't so common in, in America. So let's talk about eight weeks to wellness. It consists of five ingredients, five components, and I want to talk about each one. Obviously nutrition, meditation, massage, fitness, and chiropractic. And I want to talk about just the basic tenets of each one. Okay, and recognize, guys, that this recipe is 
all laid out for you. You cannot fail, just like a recipe. As long as you follow the ingredients and do what we ask you to do, and we don't ask you to stand on your head, and we don't ask you to eat sawdust, right? And we don't ask you to exercise. You're exercising three hours a week. Do you know how many hours are in a week? Somebody tell me. 24 times 7. 168. All right, less sleep, it's about 115. We're asking you to exercise three hours a week. Do you understand? That's less than 3% of your waking hours. And if you tell me you don't have 3% to dedicate to them, one of the most important things you could do to exercise, I'm going to tell you you have your priorities screwed up. Because exercise is going to do what? Put muscle on your body. And what did I say? Muscle is the number one determining factor of how fast your body ages. So if you tell me you don't have time to exercise, I'm going to tell you you're going to get old and fat. Okay? And if you're okay with that, then I guess i got to be okay with it. But I don't want you to be okay with it, all right? So first of all, nutrition. Food is fuel. My sister talks about this all the time. Remember what I said, energy is the capacity to do work. So every time you eat something, that food is either going to fuel your body or it's going to toxify your body. Yes? Okay? And I want you guys to start thinking about, because you're not always going to change what you eat, but every time you eat for the next couple days, I want you to look at that food and say, what is this going to do to my body in an hour? Now, you may still eat it. I recognize that. <laughs> but maybe you won't. Maybe you say, do I really want to feel like shit in two hours? Right? <laughs> maybe he'll say, no, I don't want to feel like shit in two hours. I'm not going to eat this. Okay? The quality and the quantity of your food choices matter. It's not just about quantity and portion size. We teach you that. You're eating, by the way, you eat five times a day on this program. We do not starve you. We do not believe in starving people. It is not sustainable. That's why we said you're not going to lose 10 pounds of water weight. You're putting muscle on your body. You cannot do that without fuel. You cannot burn a fire without wood. Does everybody understand? And we want your metabolism to be raging. Back to the muscle, guys. A pound of muscle, listen to this. A pound of muscle burns seven times more calories at rest than a pound of body fat. A pound of body fat sits there and does nothing. A pound of muscle is chewing up calories. And when women come to me and say, Dr. Dane, I have a slow metabolism. I say, I don't say it. I think, it, yes, because you're fat. Because <laughs> you have no muscle on your body. And if you have no muscle, you have no metabolism. Do you understand? Okay? So the quality and the quantity of your food choice matters. I want you to eat to live, not live to eat. We entertain ourselves with food. We eat 50% of our meals outside of the home. In 1950, we ate 5% of our meals outside of the home. Less than 5% of the population was obese. Today, we eat over 50% of our meals out of the home, and over 33% of our population is now obese or has a BMI over 30. Ladies, do you think there's a correlation? When you go out to eat, do you honestly, some of the things, the platters that we get, you know, we always say, we teach you on the program, it's easy portion size, guys. Carbohydrate, right? You guys remember this? Size of your fist, right? Protein, size of the palm of your hand. Fat should fit in your thumb. You're going to do oil, butter, should fit in your thumb. That's your portion size, five times a day. If you're eating that way, women, you're getting roughly about 13, 1400 calories. Men, you're getting about 15, 1600 calories. Why? Because men's hands are bigger, aren't they? Okay? You cannot use your husband's hand for your portion size. Okay? I know what you're, I know some of you were thinking about. Glycemic index. Who wants to tell me why glycemic index is so important to your nutrition and why it's important you know how much sugar is in food? Does anybody want to tell me? Does anybody know? Blood sugar. Blood sugar. Let's, let's keep going with that. Why is blood sugar important? Because I'll tell you a couple reasons. Blood glucose is one of the few molecules that crosses into your brain. Glucose is one of the few substances that crosses into your brain and it does damage at high levels. That's why you lose your eyesight and you lose your limbs because your nerves get damaged by high glucose. You've got to keep your glucose level. Next point, glucose gets converted to what? When it's high, when you're sitting at your desk and you've eaten some sugary M&Ms because they were on your, your, uh, the desk of your coworker and you just walked by and grabbed a handful and you're sitting there not burning any calories, what does that sugar get converted to? Does anybody know? fat. It gets converted to triglycerides. That's why triglycerides are one of the factors of metabolic syndrome. Triglycerides get converted to adipose tissue. And when you're not burning calories because you have no muscle and you're consuming more glucose, your body says, ladies, we're just going to store this right here and right here for later. 
Because we don't know what to do with it. We're not burning it. We'll just put it here. It's right. It's out of the way. It's not going to get in, in, in the way of my arms, my legs. Men, we're just going to put it all right here. Okay? So that's what you need to understand about nutrition. You are not fat in this country. We are not fat because we eat too much fat. I promise you. We are fat because we consume too many processed, high glycemic index, high carb meals. Do you understand? Think about it. Back in, in cave hunter days, did we have processed M&Ms, food that came in bags, chips, right? I had a woman tell me one time, I, you know, I said, we are addicted to carbohydrates in this country. She said, no, Dr. Dan, I'm not addicted to carbohydrates. I said, well, what are you addicted to? She said, potato chips. She said, I'm addicted to the salty potato chips. I said, really? I said, next time you get an addiction or a craving, go put some salt on your hand and lick it and tell me if that satisfies your craving. Because a potato chip is a high glycemic uh, food dipped in oil and fried. You are eating carbohydrates when you eat potato chips. And that's the problem in this country, guys. There is so much misinformation. People don't know what they're eating. And I'll, and I'll prove it to you. Peanut butter. Is peanut butter a carbohydrate, a fat, or a protein? What is it? Any, you guys should have said, depends on what peanut butter you buy. Because if you buy Peter Pan, it's all three. It's got bad fat, bad sugar, and bad protein in it. Do you understand? Okay? There is so much misconception, guys, and we want to teach you 70% you of your food, and I'm a realist, guys, trust me. I have birthday cake, I drink a beer, I have a glass of wine. I, I promise you, I have fun. I have a good time. My rule is 80-20. 80% of my life, I want to do the right thing. 20% of the time, I want to party and have fun. As long as I'm making a lot more deposits than I'm making withdrawals, I figure I'm doing okay. In this country, we got it bass backwards. We make 20% deposits, 80% withdrawals. We, we wonder why we're not getting anywhere. Okay? Knowledge is power, so you must know what you're eating. It says, are bagels and orange juice a good breakfast food? Most people would say yes, but it's all sugar. All sugar. Okay? Let's talk about meditation. And meditation is one of those things, especially for men, you think, well, that's something for people you know, who are at the top of the Himalayas, like the monks. That's something that's good for them, right? And Tamara said, this was probably a really important part of the program for her. Why? Because stress has major impacts on your health, major. And I will promise you, and I know this to be true for me, the state of your life is only the, res uh, the reflection of the state of your mind. Do you know that the average person has 60,000 thoughts a day? You think 60,000 thoughts, and here's the deal. If I were to put a label on every single one of your 60,000 thoughts today, that's a happy one, that's a depressed one, oh, that's an angry one, okay? That's a joyous one, that's a loving one. We labeled an emotion, don't, don't our thoughts have emotions? Yes, if we labeled an emotion on every thought, I guarantee you if we sum total your thoughts, who you are as a person most of the time reflects your thinking, doesn't it? And who controls your thoughts? You do. It's just like your respiration. Everybody, right now, because I see you're getting tired. Everybody take a deep breath in and blow out. Take one more. Deep breath in. Deep breath in. Deep as you can. Blow it out. Now, can you control your respiration? Yes. You can control your thoughts. And we teach you on the program how to do that. And meditation, meditation is being aware of your stream of consciousness. It's looking at those thoughts that are going by like water in a stream and, and paying attention and say, wow. Man, I am having a lot of stressed thoughts. There are a lot of angry thoughts. Those are a lot of judgmental thoughts I'm having. Do you understand? And changing the way you think because your state of your mind and your life is merely the state of your uh, thoughts. Okay, massage. I want everybody to do this for me. I call it the trap test. By the way, massage is not a luxury. It's not something you do on a cruise ship on vacation. It is a necessity. I want everybody to take two fingers, right? It doesn't matter, left or right hand. Let's do your left hand. I want to take your two fingers and I want you to put them right into your trap. It's this muscle here. Now I want you to push down. Push down real hard and now start rolling around. Do you guys feel that? Yeah. Is it a little uncomfortable? All right, now take your two fingers and put it on your bicep and rub it around. Is that painful? Is it? No, not nearly as much. <laughs> put it back on that muscle again and start pushing around. Ow! You feel all those knots in there? That's called tension. It's called stress. It's called having the weight of the world on your shoulders. What does a cat do when it's stressed? It arches its back and backs into a corner, doesn't it? That's called being sympathetically toned. 
You know it as the fight or flight system. When we're under stress, we go into fight or flight. Literally, we release endorphins, we release cortisol, all these stress hormones, and it causes our muscles to tension. It's it causes our muscles to tighten. It's why we carry so much tension, okay? So massage, trust me, when you get a massage on this program, you're gonna say to yourself, wow, man, now I know why this is a necessary component of the program, especially when you're exercising. Fitness, there's three components of fitness, guys, and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it, but I told you already, no decline with age is dramatic or, or significant than decline in lean body mass. And what's lean body mass? It's muscle. muscle, okay? 30 minutes of exercise per day decreases your chance of cancer by 50%. If I told you tomorrow I could give you a pill that's gonna decrease your chance of all cancers by 50%, would you take it? Yes or no? Yeah. Most people would take it. It's called exercise. Start taking it, okay? We focus on three components of exercise. Again, men, great at strength training, right? You're a power lifter, can bench five, five, uh, 500 pounds, okay? But we gotta focus on cardio and mobility. Can you squat, right? Can you bend over and touch your toes? Are you mobile? Do you know that God gave us really good signals? When we're dead, we are stiff as a board. <laughs> stiff. I had to dissect them in chiropractic. I mean, they were stiff, right, Brian? That's why they call them stiffs. So I think God gave us a really good signal. Don't get stiff, okay? Life is motion. It's not stiffness, okay? And never mind. I'm not even going to talk about that. <laughs> and then finally, chiropractic. You say, well, why is chiropractic a part of the program? Well, A, because I'm a chiropractor and I developed the program. And darn it, I wanted it to be a part of the program. So there you go. All right? But really, guys, my father and grandfather are chiropractors. And, you know, chiropractic is, you hear, it's one of those things you got to believe in. You don't have to believe in anything. This is America, okay? But I am telling you, chiropractic is the core foundation of this program. And why? Because your nervous system is the most important system in your body. Your brain is the only organ they haven't figured out how to transplant, have they? They can give you a baboon's liver. They can uh, replace your heart function, your kidney function, right? But they cannot replace your brain. Your brain is, is housed within your skull. Your spinal cord is housed within, you found out, within a movable column of 24 bones called your spine. And when that spine and nervous system is functioning well, you have proper communication. And when that spine and nervous system is interfered with, you cannot have proper communication. So I could put the best foods in you and the best thoughts in you, right? And the best movements in you. But if you have a big old bone spur on C5, which is probably where you had it, 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 to get the numbness in your fingers. I don't care what I'm doing. You've got to remove the roadblocks. And I look at x-rays all day long. 70% of the workforce sits for a living now. 70%. Do you think the human spine was designed to sit for seven, eight, nine hours a day? And are we sitting more these days or less? More. more. We have 53 joints. God blessed us with 53 joints in our spine. And I would say, if God put 53 joints in anything, he expected that sucker to move, right? Look how much my arm moves. That's one joint, right? The reason I am such a bad dancer is because I can move my 53 joints, okay? So you live your life. I always say this, guys, but it's true. You live your life through your nervous system. The reason you see me, the reason you hear me, the reason you can talk, you can animate, maintain your balance is your nervous system. But your nervous system is housed within a movable column of bones called your spine. So you better, how many people go to the dentist on a regular basis? Why? Because you want your teeth to last as long as humanly possible, and so do I. My dentist is very proud of me. I only have one cavity. You know why? Because I do what he tells me to do. He says, Dane, and I'll never forget when I was 17 years old and a hygienist came in and she said, are you flossing? And I didn't want to lie. I said, no. She, go, she goes out of the room, she comes back, she brings the, the, the most nasty set of teeth I've ever seen. And she said, good, because this is what your teeth are going to look like 30 years from now. I never missed another day of flossing. And I have no cavities, right? I never had braces. I have all my teeth. They're nice and white. Why? Because I take care of them. And if we had our spine on our face like our teeth, trust me, you would take better care of it. Because you'd be able to see it just like your teeth. And most of us, because our spine's buried in, deep inside of us, we can't see it. But Brian and I look at your spines all day long, even you young guys, okay? You've got to start taking care of this thing. Who wants to get old and look like this? 
Why? Does, does, do you wake up? Did a woman wake up one day and she had great posture and she just woke up one day and said, gosh, I don't know how this happened. No, she went from this to this to this to this to this, didn't she? We have the ability to change that, guys. Okay? It's called chiropractic care. So let's, let's wrap this up. I want to talk about what, uh, what's next. I want you to get involved in this program, right? And there's a simple reason why I want you to get involved with the program. And it's right here. It's right here. It's right here. <laughs> you are going to leave here tonight, and you are either going to become selfless or selfish. And when you are sick and you don't feel good, who are you thinking of? You think of yourself. When you're sick, when you have a migraine, when you're not feeling good, you're thinking about yourself. And I promise you, one of the best books I ever read, which I would highly recommend you guys picking up, is a book called Authentic Happiness. And that book changed and saved my marriage and my life. Because I was about 32, 33 years old. I was, had been married about seven, eight years. I was headed for divorce. Why? Because my dad had been married and divorced twice. And that's what I knew in my family. In my family, divorce is rampant. And I was on the same path. And my biological mother one day sends me this book called Authentic Happiness. I got it in the mail. And on the inside cover it said, To my son, whom I wish nothing but authentic happiness, read this book. And she, I don't know, read this book. So when your mom sends you a book like that, you read it. And you know what I got out of that book? That true happiness, and this was a guy from the University of Pennsylvania that studied happy people. And he studied happy people that he called authentically happy. They weren't happy because they had chocolate. Although chocolate can make you happy, I, I, I understand ladies. They weren't happy because they bought, bought something, they bought a new car, a new home. They weren't happy because they had a drink, right? They were authentically happy. And you know, the only common thing, the only common denominator in happy people, you know what it is? This one thought revolutionized my life. Does anybody know what it is? They serve beyond their own needs. They serve beyond their own needs. And you know, up to that point in my life, there was one person I cared more about than anybody else, and that was Dane Donahue. And at that point in my life, I remember praying to God to change me. And God did change me. And I became a better father and a better husband and a better chiropractor. And it's when I started developing eight weeks to wellness. So when I tell you selfless doesn't mean that you think less of yourself. What it means is you think of yourself less often. And these days at 44 years old, getting ready to be 45 next month, I don't think about myself that often. But I think about my wife all the time. Nine, we're 20 years of marriage this year. I think about my kids. I think about people like Brian and coming and helping and supporting him. And I will tell you at 44, I am happier than I've ever been. Do you understand? And you know why? Because I take care of myself. Because true happiness, you cannot be truly happy and if you're selfish, if you're thinking about yourself because you're sick. And you cannot understand the value, right guys who've done it? You cannot understand the value of the pro productivity and the joy this brings back to your life until you go through it. So it may seem like an investment to you right now, but I'm gonna, I, I promise you it will turn out to be one of the best investments that you can ever make because make, you're investing in the most important person that you know, which is you. Okay? It was great getting to know you guys. I want to come back and I want to hear more success stories next time. Okay? Thank you very much. Thank you.